at ease. All right, motherfuckers, let's get one thing straight. You and everyone you love will eventually die. You're eventually going to contract a disease, suffer a compound fracture, or maybe just get the shits after eating a bad freeze-dried burrito. My point is, in the absence of modern medicine and law and order, the average human life expectancy is only about 35 years old. That said, don't expect to live forever just because you bought a fancy gun and stockpiled canned Vienna sausage. The truth is, most survivalists aren't even actual survivalists. At best, they're no-frills, extreme campers, and at worst, they're delusional crockpots who have conjured these elaborate scenarios where whatever equipment they have chosen to hoard is magically going to be useful. I mean, guys with pistols or shotguns always imagine fighting unarmored enemies. Guys with semi-automatic rifles with steel-tipped bullets always imagine fighting enemies with level 3 body armor, but never enemies with level 4 body armor. Guys with 50 caliber rifles always think they're going to take out low-flying helicopters or unarmored trucks, but never tanks, jets, or armored personnel carriers. No one can teach you how to survive every possible catastrophe because no one can predict every possible catastrophe and adequately prepare for all of them. I'm here to make sure you don't do the stupid cliche bullshit that's going to get you killed the quickest. Lesson number one. Be mindful of scarcity. You see, the supply of manufactured goods is going to decrease exponentially over time in the wake of any major catastrophe. Supplies are going to be fairly abundant early on and then quickly become depleted. That means idiots driving around in pickup trucks shooting guns in the air are going to be the first ones to run out of fuel and ammunition. So it's going to be important to conserve those resources until using them is absolutely necessary. The same principle also applies to natural resources. If every person in Michigan abandoned urban areas and went out into the woods, the average person would only occupy an area roughly the size of a football field. That's not enough land to live off of. There are also less than 2 million deer in a state with nearly 10 million people. That means that if everyone tried hunting, we'd run out of game species really quickly. Lesson number two. Buying a cool gun doesn't give you superpowers. Okay, let's say you drop three grand on a state-of-the-art tactical rifle that they promised you isn't exactly what Navy SEAL Team 6 used to kill Bin Laden. What happens when the little $50 extractor on it breaks? Stick to proven, mass-produced, widely available, military or police-issued weapons in standard calibers. Tens of millions of them exist, and it's going to be much easier to salvage pins and springs from non-working weapons. Also, avoid weapons in obscure calibers. It doesn't matter if they're marginally more powerful than standard issue calibers. You're going to run out of ammo eventually, and you won't be able to find new supplies. This kind of rifle is designed to be fired at stationary targets on a known distance range. It would be extremely impractical in an urban environment, and the wood stock would eventually rot away and prolonged exposure to extreme weather. This kind of goes without saying, but please stay away from the gimmicky mall ninja bullshit weapons accessories. Things like cheap high power rifle scopes, red dots that use watch batteries and aren't waterproof or impact resistant, I mean 37mm flare launchers, bump stocks, wrist stabilizers. Also stay away from low weight receivers made out of things like magnesium, polymer, or carbon fiber. They're not very durable. If you're going to go with optics, either buy something so well engineered that's going to stand up to years of abuse, or just stick to iron sights. If you're going to buy military surplus body armor, avoid models with olive green outer covers as they likely were made the 60s or 70s and predate Kevlar. They offer very limited protection against some small caliber handgun rounds. If you buy a vest from the 80s or 90s, it'll be lined with Kevlar and offer a higher degree of protection against most standard handgun rounds. If you want full protection from handgun calibers, I recommend more modern body armor from the mid-2000s. Either of these vests will protect you from virtually all handgun calibers, and they both contain pockets that allow you to put in armor plates. The two most common types of armor plate in the U.S. are the SAPI and the e -SAPI. 
A medium sappy weighs approximately 4 pounds and covers an area 12 by 9 and a half inches. A sappy can be identified by the fact it says 762 millimeter M80 ball protection. E sappy stands for enhanced small arms protective inserts. The e sappy is easily identified by the fact it says 762 millimeter APM2 protection. AP stands for armor piercing. A medium plate weighs approximately five and a half pounds and offers 12 by nine and a half inches of protection. The only real difference between an e sappy and a sappy is that the e sappy is one and a half pounds heavier and offers protection against armor piercing rifle rounds. Before purchasing any kind of sappy plate, always grab the ends and attempt to bend it and listen for crinkling noises. If you hear a crinkling noise, it means the plate is damaged and completely useless. Armor plates are also available on the commercial market. Plates made from AR500 steel weigh approximately 8 pounds, but are easily penetrated by high velocity 5.56 mm bullets. Plates made out of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene weigh approximately 4 pounds, but are easily penetrated by steel tipped 5.56 mm bullets. Lesson number 3. This is the time tested ancient secret to winning battles. Only attack forces that are weaker than yours. Well, it is true that with advanced weapons, better training, innovative tactics, an insatiable will to win, you can defeat a superior force. It's also true that enough troops will basically defeat any enemy. The problem is that military historians tend to view military blunders as courageous acts of heroism in face of overwhelming odds, as opposed to some arrogant prick picking a fight he couldn't win and getting most of his men killed. See, the thing is, it doesn't matter how good you are, a large enough force will always be able to defeat you. We don't celebrate the Spartans because they won at the Battle of Thermopylae. We celebrate them because they lost slowly. They lasted way longer than you would reasonably expect a force that small to last against overwhelming odds. But they still fucking lost! I mean, the Knights Templar failed to secure the Holy Land. General Lee couldn't defeat the Union Army. The Wehrmacht couldn't conquer the Soviet Union. You can be the best in the world at what you do. If you try to do too much, you will still fail. The Japanese samurai were the best swordsmen in the entire world throughout the Middle Ages. The problem is, they were still using swords in the 19th century when everyone else had moved on to rifles. Thus, their proficiency with edged weapons gave them no tactical advantage at that point. Don't think you can focus all of your time and energy into a single set of weapons and tactics and expect to reign supreme indefinitely. I mean, even if you're a decorated military veteran, most of your training is pretty much useless at that point. You're not going to have fire support from mortars, machine guns, tanks, helicopters, jets. I mean, at this point, you're basically just some dick with a rifle who could hypothetically hit someone standing perfectly still, silhouetted on a hilltop, exactly 500 yards away. My point is, the amount of time you can survive is essentially limited to the first major problem you encounter that you can't find a solution to. You can run out of food, water, medicine, or ammunition once, and you're pretty much dead. That's why it's going to be important to maintain relationships with as many people as possible. The larger your network is, the more resources you will potentially have access to. What I'm basically saying is, be a little bit more village people and a little less Ted Nugent. If your team has a broad base of people from diverse backgrounds with different skills, in the long run, you're going to be much stronger than some lone asshole with a bunch of guns who no one likes. I mean, you gotta sleep eventually, and your guns aren't going to protect themselves.